Okay, folks, I promise promise now this is your last set of landforms. Um, landforms are quite uh, a key part of this module and it's because um, if we go back to the idea of a system, the outputs of the coastal system are landforms and therefore because the coastal system is quite big and it's got loads of stuff going on, there are quite a few different landforms. Um, they will certainly require, I would say, um, the biggest chunk of your revision collectively because you've got the first set of landforms that you did, um, the, the uh, revision notes task on, so like caves, arches, stacks, stumps, spits, all of those. Then you've got the landforms that I taught you, which were estuaries, sand dunes, that lot. And then you've got the landforms associated with sea level change. So, yeah, I know there's a lot. Um, but they are really important. Okay, we're on page 61 still, and we're now down to question five. The first video goes through the first four questions. We're now on to question five. Okay, um, first of all, just a bit of English language stuff. What on earth do the words emergent and submergent mean? Uh, so I've just put definitions up on there. You've probably heard about people emerging from caves or emerging from, uh, where else could you emerge from? Emerging from the house on a bright summer's day or whatever, where it's something that becomes apparent that you couldn't see before. And submergent, just think submarine, nice and easy. Right, so we're gonna start off with the, I don't know if they're easier or not. I couldn't decide which way around to put them. We're gonna start off with emergent. So these folks are landforms that used to be at or below sea level and are now very definitely above sea level. So look, here's a headland, here's a bay, here's a stump, here's a cliff with maybe a line of weakness. That might be the beginning of a cave. It kind of looks a bit like a coastline, but it's covered in grass and there are sheep grazing on it. Clearly, this is not a coastline anymore. This is called a relict cliff, so it's an old cliff line. This is actually taken in Scotland. This is um, a beach, so you've got a storm beach here, we've got a cave here. Uh, you can see possibly a little bit of a wave cut notch there. Again, it's kind of got classic coastal features, but there are plants growing on it. And the thing about the plants is they wouldn't be growing there if the sea was here on a regular basis. So the plants are sort of your giveaway clue that we are very much above sea level now. That's a relict cliff. This, again, you might get a sense of deja vu because you might think, oh, I'm sure she showed us a picture like this. I did. This is New Zealand. New Zealand is rising because of um, magma, because of tectonics. So the coastline used to be kind of here. And now it's here. And these things are called raised beaches. Notice that your giveaway clue, ladies and gents, is the vegetation. If there are plants growing on a beach, the sea is not getting to that beach very often, if ever. So you've got relict cliffs and raised beaches. There's another raised beach. So all of that used to be beach. And now the sea is down here. So that's the old cliff line, that's the raised beach. That's the old cliff line, that's the old beach. That's the old cliff line, that's the old beach. That's Iceland, which has got some of the most impressive in the world. That's the old coastline, that's the old beach. So basically, relict cliffs and raised beaches tend to occur together. Your giveaway clue is that there will be plants growing, which means the sea is just not getting there. And, without wishing to be patronising, the sea isn't there. <laughs> That's a pretty good clue. It's probably not going to be far away, okay? But it's definitely not up here. That's the old cliff line. They will make this reasonably obvious to you because this is quite a tricky part of the syllabus. Uh, so you're looking for things that look very coastal but are covered in plants and they're called relict cliffs and raised beaches. And they occur 
because either the land has gone up, isostatic, or the sea level has gone down, eustatic. Well, we actually know, don't we, that sea levels are not falling anywhere. We've got climate change, ice melt, thermal expansion, sea levels are rising. So the only reason you are going to get relict cliffs and raised beaches is because of isostatic change at the moment in the world, okay? Um, so you will find them in Iceland because of tectonic activity, Scotland because it's still recovering from the last ice age, New Zealand because of tectonic activity, and that's Scotland, Scotland. So currently in the world, you would only get these landforms because of isostatic uplift. <clears throat> Do excuse my diagrams. Um, so what I'm trying to show you here, this is the um, emergent landform side. The only way you're going to get a landform that used to be at or below sea level and now has emerged in that you can now see it is because the land has gone up or the sea level's gone down. We can count that one out, that one's not happening, so it must be this one. Which means, ladies and gents, that submergent landforms must be because of this. It's either because isostatically your land is being squashed, or eustatically sea levels are rising. Now we know that this is happening everywhere on planet Earth at the moment because of climate change. And we've also talked about how this is happening in the south of the UK. So the south of the UK has got both of these things going on. And guess what? You find some submergent landforms. Okay, think submarine. These used to be above the sea and they're now underneath, just like a submarine. And there are two landforms. Uh, rears are what we have in the south of the UK. So this is a drainage basin, you might remember those from the water cycle, and all a rhea is, is a river that has been flooded by the sea. So the technical definition is a drowned river valley. As sea levels rise, they flood the river valleys, leaving only the high land visible. So you can see it's exactly the same drainage basin, but there's more water in it because sea water has flooded the valleys. Uh, we have loads of these in the south of the UK. Uh, Falmouth, which is the one shown here. Dartmouth is rear. Uh, there is Dartmouth for you. Uh, there are loads and loads and loads. The easiest way to tell is if the river is tidal. Okay, we generally, those of us that have grown up in the southwest of the UK, we kind of think that's normal. Well, it's not massively normal all over the planet. Um, it's very normal for a rear because here is, this is, uh, this is at Kingsbridge, I think. So here is the river <laughs> and then at high tide, that river fills up with seawater and it's quite a different place, isn't it? So if your river is tidal, quite a long way inland, it's a rear. That, that's basically how you tell. Now, we don't have any of these in the south of the UK, but the principle is exactly the same. If you're ever lucky enough to go to Norway and Sweden and see the fjords, it's exactly the same idea. The only difference is what created this valley was a glacier. And we don't study glaciers, so these are you don't need to know too much about them. But glaciers carve out massive, what are called U-shaped valleys. So rivers create V-shaped valleys. So literally like tsh -tsh with quite steep sides. And then um, fields are what are called U-shaped valleys. Okay. And they, the principle is exactly the same in that they have filled up with seawater. So that's a V shape and that's a U shape. I don't need you to get too bogged down or stressed about this. I really, really don't. It's just as long as you understand the principle that rears and fields are both valleys that have now been flooded by seawater, you've got it. 
all right you've got everything that you need to know that's fine so rears we have in the south of the uk fields you'd have to look slightly further afield okay now i am not going to spend too long on this slide because you could uh, just pause and copy that down if you wanted to all right so now you can answer um, half of question seven Dalmatian coastline, I'm only mentioning these very briefly in case you get a really sneaky question. These are not technically on the syllabus. Um, so all of these were river valleys that have now been filled up by seawater. So you get this really weird coastline. Um, so you get this series of islands. All these islands are at the top of the hills, either side of the valley, and then the valley is now filled up by seawater. It's just this very, very strange coastline. Um, this is in Croatia, but um, yeah, not, not crucial for you to know, but I just thought I'd mention them. Okay, so you should now be able to answer all of the questions on page 61. And I'm going to finish this video with just a nod to the future because you can't really talk about sea level change without talking about uh, what's going on in the world with, with the climate. Sea levels are rising because of eustatic change, um, ice melt, thermal expansion, etc. And you can see that since uh, 93, we've had about 80 millimetres of sea level rise. That doesn't sound a lot, but if it just keeps going and keeps going, it's going to change tide heights, it's going to make storm surges more intense, it's going to have an ongoing impact. You know, if you've built your seawall, let's say, in your management scheme at a particular height, well, if the sea level is rising and the waves get bigger, then actually your seawall might be useless about 10 years before you thought it was going to be useless. It's more of a problem than perhaps 80 millimetres suggests, I guess, is the point I'm trying to make. Kiribati is an island nation already being affected by sea level change. Closer to home, the country probably most worried is the Netherlands. You can see huge sort of problem areas there. We're not, you know, uh, immune to it in the UK by any any stretch of the imagination. It is a it's a concern uh, for everybody really. Storm surge and high tides magnify so we can link together a few elements of the syllabus here can't we? We can talk about high spring tides which are always going to happen. If that coincides with a really bad storm and your sea levels are already higher you've got a house here that might have been affected in 2010 well, by 2100, that storm surge might actually affect the city that's a little bit further inland. So the coast is a system, remember, if you change one thing, you are going to have knock-on effects for the rest of that system. It's going to affect millions of people. We'll talk about this in a lot more depth in year two when we do climate change properly. Um, if you live in Holland, <laughs> you might already have responded to the threat by building yourself a floating house. How cool are these? Um, so these houses are kind of moored up, uh, but the idea is that if sea levels do rise, it's not the end of the world because your house will just float, which is quite cool. This is what we've done in the UK at the moment. We talked about this when we talked about um, management techniques. This is a barrage. This is in fact the Thames Barrier. Um, we are having to close the Thames Barrier more and more frequently because of rising sea levels. Um, when it's high spring tide now, they do have to quite often close the Thames Barrier. Um, how long will that be uh, operational for? When will we have to maybe raise the height? There are lots and lots of, of questions. Um, now, this YouTube is not compulsory, but if you've been confused about landforms and sea level change it is a really good documentary um, so if you've really struggled with this section i'm going to hand you over to this 
chat who will explain it, I'm sure, better than I can. Okay, thanks, folks. Uh, <laughs> um, email if you have questions. <laughs>